when Galileo Galilei looked into the telescope that he so newly acquired or built, we don't know yet, he saw something magnificent. This was the first time that someone used a telescope that was actually invented in Holland for something completely different, for military purposes, for example. But he was among the first few to peer into the skies. What he saw was, of course, a true wonder. I'm not sure if the animation works here. Let's see here. There we go. The thing is that this telescope became almost overnight a true success because it was adopted by the science of astronomy and maybe the more dubious science of astrology, but at least for observing the bodies of the heavens. And it led to dramatic changes in the way that we understand those bodies of the heavens. At the same time, not many months after that, because once you understand how to use optics, you can kind of invert it and you can make a microscope. Galileo Galilei also used a microscope, but what they saw and what he saw was completely unexpected. They saw things that they could ha not have imagined. They saw things that didn't fit to any existing model of the world. And therefore, it took something like 100 years before the microscope had anywhere near the same success as the telescope. Basically, what this means is that our language, our current understanding of the world, does shape the way that we understand new information. So you can imagine here today and tomorrow where you're exposed to a lot of different things. We've talked about crypto cryptocurrencies, human robot interaction, virtual and augmented reality, and so forth. You will be challenged on your long-held views about how things work. Now, today I'm going to add a little nudge to that as well, because I'm going to focus on your minds. And by doing that, I will start with a little personal story. It's not that personal, but it's more my professional uh, background as a clinical neuropsychologist. I had the opportunity to see a lot of different patients. And as I just started to kind of think a little bit about what the, that meant, what those disorders meant, they gave me an idea how the human mind works. So one patient on the left side, the wheelchair, was a person that, in many respects, was paralyzed. A lesion to his right parietal lobe led to a paralyzation of a paralysis of the left body part. That's how the brain is wired. The left is controlled by the right, and vice versa. Now, the interesting thing was that while he was paralyzed, he didn't notice. This was not just a pure paralysis. It also leads to a neglect. It's called a unilateral neglect. What that means is that this patient is neglecting everything to his left. So he's shaving on his right hand, right side of the, uh, the, uh, the face. He doesn't shave on the left side. He only takes clothes on on the right side, not on the left side. He starts complaining about getting half as much food as the others because he can only see half the plate. So an additional thing that if you are extraordinary unfortunate, you also get an additional lesion, or the lesion you have is additionally severe, meaning that what this leads to is that you also have something called anosognosia, which means lack of insight into your own condition. So this patient, when I talked to him, was sitting in his wheelchair, he claimed that he was, well, you know, just well, healthy, he could go home. He was intelligible, so you can lead any conversation with him on any different kind of topic, as long as you didn't talk about the things that he was so uh, problematic about. And he also came up with stories. I asked him, for example, why he was sitting in a wheelchair when he was healthy and could go home. And he said that he liked being shoved around in a hospital by the cute nurses. And this is a story that he believed himself. This is not just kind of a, you know, repression like Freudian psychology or something like that. This is something that his mind makes up a story that he believes. So that's one insight. The mind creates stories. The other one is a totally different story. This patient came in with his daughter, and it started all when he was at home. He was at home living as a retired 
uh, person, and then all of a sudden, in his living room, his daughter, her husband, and their children were there in the living room. That was not announced, but he was happy, so he went down to the kitchen to get some cookies and, and some cake and some uh, coffee and tea, served it to them, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. They were just sitting there as still images. And then he, after some time, he was kind of puzzled, and he took everything out to the kitchen again, and then came out to the living room, and they were gone. And of course, he was furious. He called his daughter and, you know, yelled at her and said, that was a bad experience. This is what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And it happened a couple of times. And the third time, he started thinking, hmm, maybe it's something wrong with me. Maybe it's me. And it turned out he was suffering from something called a rare type of dementia that's called frontal temporal dementia. And some patients, unfortunately, start to get psychosis. But the interesting thing about this patient is that he'd had a critical self-reflection just in total opposition to the first patient. The first patient had no critical sense of what his disorders were, while this one said, there's something wrong with me. So what I'm going to do today is hopefully to give you a little bit of a span between some of the disorders you might have, in a healthy environment, a healthy brain, and kind of get you out of that anosognosia, the lack of knowledge into yourself, and into this position where you can start to think critically about your own decision-making, be it any way from your home to your work environment as well. And we'll tie this into learning and also in terms of innovation work as well. Okay. If you think about Aristotle, of course, <laughs> those philosophers were saying a lot of things. But one thing he said already at that time was that, hmm, we think so much with our conscious minds. But there might be this kind of irrational thing that drives our behaviors as well, you know, as a position to platonic ideas, for example. And what he claimed was basically that irrational passions they are probably there just as much as our rational thoughts as well. Now we know, we also know that irrational passions actually make out more of our human mind. That's kind of the iceberg analogy that Freud used in its time. It seems that everything we do is mostly driven by subconscious experiences or subconscious processes. It means that if we start counting all the processes that the brain is doing, the brain is responsible for me not tripping. I don't need to think about every single step I take. I don't need to formulate you know, consciously every word I say. So if you take all these different processes that the brain does, it makes that vastly more than our conscious minds. And in a study we did uh, more than a decade ago, we looked at what happens in the brain. Because we, I wanted to understand why is it that way. Can't we just think consciously about everything? And when we looked at what happens in the brain when we become conscious of something, we found that even for a very simple stimulus, or just paying attention to a screen, and all of a sudden you see a triangle. Triangle, for example. Seeing that triangle, in contrast to not seeing it, creates this vast activation of the brain. It requires what we call the global workspace of the brain. So being conscious, what you hopefully are now, about what I'm saying, paying attention to my words, thinking about it, that conscious content fills out more or less the entire bandwidth of your brain, which means that the brain can't do anything else unless it can automatize and make it subconscious. So the reason that we are subconscious is that we have a limited bandwidth. The brain can't deal with every information consciously at the same time, so it has to go on autopilot on a lot of things. The problem with that, of course, is that it leads to sometimes some automatic behaviors that we don't like. And in the term of innovation work, I'm going to show you a couple of biases that we have. For example, we have the um, confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is basically that when you hear something that is... Um, we, t we tend to basically look for evidence that support our ideas. 
So if you are, have a vested interest in something, and you find some confirming evidence and something that goes, goes against your belief, you tend to pay more attention to what's confirming your idea. This is a, an aid thing that we have. The second type of bias we have is what we can call an anchoring effect. And an anchoring effect is that when you are given information about something, it tends to influence how, how you're processing information that comes after that. So in this context, if you are, for example, presented with a price of something, and then you say, for example, uh, if you are given a price, do you think this product is more or less than 30 kroners, for example? This bottle, for example, is it more or less than 30 kroners? And you say, yeah, it's probably more, and then you ask, how many kroners, Swedish kroners, do you think it is? Well, maybe 60, for example. If I instead ask you, do you think this is more or less than 100 kroners? And then ask you, what do you think the price is? It will influence the price we make, our price estimate. So that means that there are certain things that, when we don't know about it, can affect the way we think and evaluate different things. The third thing, I like a lot is the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's the relationship between how much you actually know and how confident you feel when you make statements. This does not only relate to te uh, technology or innovation, it relates to certain politicians as well. And as you can see, there's an initial phase that you have virtually no knowledge about the topic, but still you state something with such a certainty that you must be an expert. First year psychology students is a very good example. You can never find a more confident psychologist than in a first year student of psychology. But over time you get this level of despair as well. As you get more information you figure out almost this Socratic idea that there's so much I don't know. How can I ever get to know this? And you get into that value of despair. But then if you persist and you learn even more, this is the area where you can learn, truly learn, and get more confident and true objective learning into a subject matter. And you can see this in technology as well. You can see this for virtual reality, for example. Before Oculus went on, a, on Kickstarter and, and got the huge success they have, there was this level of, you know, we've gone through this kind of hype cycle that showed that there's a lot of you know, potential in this technology, and then all of a sudden people said, yeah, but it doesn't seem to work properly. So you had this disappointment as well. But now, after Kickstarter campaign of uh, Oculus, for example, and others, we've seen that now we're in more a realistic scenario where knowledge follows our confidence to a much larger extent. And then again, there might be some challenges to that as well. And finally, I'm not sure if there's anyone from IKEA here, but it's very rare that you actually have an effect called after you. But there is something called an IKEA effect, which means that when I build something, I build this shelf, I ascribe more value to it than people that typically come from on the outside. And think about that if you run a project. If you have a vested interest, into a particular project, you develop, let's say, we're going to invest in virtual reality, then that investment alone can lead you to bias the evaluation of the success of that project. So as we become transformation leaders, we need to think about our own biases in this process. It's not straightforward, kind of one is one here. We need to think about the innate subconscious biases that we all have. And I'm going to take you kind of on two different emotional extremes on that. On the one extreme, you probably might experience on that a little bit already, but at the end of tomorrow, you will be inundated with information about new technologies, new solutions, you're missing out, totally horrible. You're not doing anything right. Because we are talking about moonshots. We're talking about making huge leaps. We're making disruptive innovation. How does that feel for you? It feels disruptive. It feels like losing out. And it feels like a moonshot going here and into this kind of unforeseeable future. It's ambiguous. 
Will I succeed? Will this go good? Will we make mistakes? And this is something that the brain automatically responds negatively to. When you do a brain scan, and you can see the, the brain areas here, there's a, one structure, actually one in both hemispheres, left and right. It's called the amygdala. And this type of structure is actually pretty stupid. Because once you sit in your home watching a horror movie, your home safe, watching a two-dimensional screen, probably not virtual reality yet, and you're watching a horror movie, and you are scared to death. You're tense, your pulse starts racing, you are sweating in the palm of your hand, your pupils are dilating. All that happens because of this stupid structure, because it believes that you are in danger. Now, unfortunately, this structure is also involved when we are making financial decisions. We don't have a center in our brains for making financial decisions, for understanding money, not even for understanding a smartphone. So we need to tap into existing resources. And this structure is used for exactly that. And it means that we have a loss aversion. We are not taking too many risks. We're actually a little bit risk averse. We have to you know, be persuaded. But then again, if you think about ambiguity, the moonshot. The moonshot is even worse because then you don't even know the possibility of the different outcomes. And that leads to an even stronger fear response. The amygdala is even more active. And your fear response, your withdrawal, is even stronger. So this is by far, a, you know, what we don't want to achieve today or tomorrow is for you to say, oh, this is way too long, this is, I mean, this is way too, too, too risky. I don't even know where to start. There's so many things I should do. Hopefully, what we can end up doing is to make some, break some moonshots down into smaller incremental steps. At the, at the end of that spectrum, I'm sorry for the text issue there. We have the complete opposite, hubris. Also micro foundations of hubristic behaviors. And hubris is kind of a strange phenomenon. We tend to ascribe it to you know, post hoc, when someone has done a mistake and we can say, yeah, it was hubris. It's very hard to us, for us to say that hubris is something that happens here and now. We have typically ascribe it to historical events or something that happened yesterday. But what we have done uh, while I was running my lab at the Copenhagen Business School was to test the effects of incremental rewards on risk-taking behaviors. And what we found was that if we give people rewards, so what we did was the half of uh, the participants we tested were given immediate rewards, like they won and they were like um, given a prize, and they were also talked to by the experimenter, like, man, you're doing so well, this is way better than any other people we've tested. That was the only thing. The other ones didn't get any rewards, they just played the game. But what happened was stunning. The people who were given reward in the beginning became much more risk-seeking in the subsequent games. They took, took many, more game, uh, many more risks, they did faster decision making, so they took less time to actually think about their, their choices. So they basically shifted from, if anyone knows the terminology, from a kind of a system two rational kind of conscious thinking to a system one subconscious emotional decision making process. So imagine that you're running, you have an idea, and you have a project, and you follow that, and you get immediate rewards. And this might actually be a problem. This might actually lead you to take more risks than necessary. So, in order to do this, this, this knowledge that we can start having for ourselves, we can apply to guide the way that we try to understand how people respond to different processes. And of course, how can we understand how consumers are responded to our next VR device or a new mobile app? or something completely new. How can we make sure that people respond to that the way we want? Of course, we can ask them questions. We can do surveys, we can do interviews and focus groups. But what we've found again and again and again is that those methods are poor guides to understand exactly what people want. I think Hinder Ford put it very nicely, saying that if I had asked people what they wanted, they probably wanted to say, I want 
faster horses. Because people, again, we are poor at telling what we want in the future. We're actually better at telling what others want in the future than ourselves. So there might be something else that we need to de develop. And going back to you know, how we should think about the questions we're asking, when we talk about asking people questions, what do you remember of this thing you just tested? Or what did you like about it? We're talking about one particular brain system. It's the conscious, rational system. This is typically related to what we see kind of to declarative memory, what I can declare. That's divided into episodic memory, so I remember what I did yesterday. Or semantic memory, I know the meaning of certain words. That is what I, that, what I can declare. On the other side, we have a subconscious memory where habits are, for example. So that means that if I only do focus groups and interviews and surveys, I will only target one side of the story. And as I mentioned before, subconscious processes are by far the strongest drivers of our choices. The conscious is more like a narrative. It comes up with a good, coherent story, like the first patient I talked about. It makes sense, I believe it. But what actually drives our behavior is the subconscious part. So one way to do this is that you can measure brain activity. That's one of the things we do. If you want to have your brain scan, we have a stand outside. That's actually true, you can have your brain scan. This is something you can do to measure your emotional responses. You can measure your cognitive responses. So are you thinking a lot about what is going on? We can also measure things like, of course, visual attention with eye tracking. What are you paying attention to? What are you missing? And this allows us to break down any consumer journey into, instead of measuring something in the beginning and then asking questions at the end, we can measure with a millisecond accuracy exactly what people can, what they're responding to. Eventually, what leads to a choice. To give you a couple of examples of how that can be done, imagine you make a new app. It could be any app. It could also be in virtual reality, for example. And the question is, if the connection is bad, or if there's a bug in the app you have made, does that really matter? We tested that. So with Ericsson's Consumer Lab and Vodafone, we tested what the effect of such delays have on people. If you ask people, you know, using a net promoter score or you know, other measures, or just asking them, how much a delay would you accept before you started to do something else, you didn't like the app? And we tested on YouTube and web browsing. And people said, you know, three, four seconds, maybe five seconds at most. And when we tested people in Denmark, for example, we found that the delay, the effect of the delay happened, or the response to that happened already at two seconds. Two to three seconds. That's when people start to have an increase, the top graph there, in cognitive demand leading to stress, and a drop in emotional responses going from positive to negative, meaning that their enjoyment of the content actually goes down. In Germany, it was one second. In Singapore, it was nine seconds. But then the response is the same. We compared this to watching a horror movie. The stress response is the same. We also compared it to driving in Jakarta traffic. Trust me, that is stressful. And it was comparable, so the delay effect is comparable to driving in Jakarta traffic. As you will probably hear tomorrow as well, we did studies together with Lowe's and Google to test new technologies in how consumers are making decisions using new technologies. So for example, when choosing how to, you know, which, which part of a kitchen, you, know, you want to replace a kitchen, normally you would go to the store, you go with your spouse, and you have to spend a lot of time discussing and thinking and negotiating how this would look at home, correct? That's actually a lot of the, you know, that's actually another IKEA effect, is going into IKEA and see if you, your marriage survives afterwards. But that is part of the, the problem, is that a lot of the time you spend discussing how would this look at home, trying to visualize and negotiating how it looks. By using 
Google's platform, the, what turned out to be the, the Tango platform, we could measure exactly what happened when people, and you can see the examples here. So this is what the person is looking at. The person is trying to find some furniture, position the furniture, select different furnitures, can wipe it all out and start all over again. But it allows us, it allowed the customer to basically try out. And you've seen, you've probably seen a lot of those uh, AR devices before. What turned out to be the case is that compared to the vignette, which means being in the store, trying to imagine how it would look, was overload. It was not an enjoyable trip. It was too much information to hold in anyone's head. First of all, you have to have the price, you have to have the look of it, how would this look in my home? You go to the next kitchen system and say, how will this look and how does that compare to this and how does the price? It's too much information. So we reach overload. The people reach overload. The second level was to try augmented reality devices such as you know, the HoloLens, for example. It was good, but the whole device was completely different. Nobody had tried the HoloLens at this time. So the whole setup was different. It was unfamiliar. But by comparison, when you did it on a phablet, which is a very familiar format, then you didn't have to learn something new. And we saw that that was when people felt that this is you know, cognitively not overloading, but it's not boring either. And it helped people make better decisions to better find a solution that we're happy with. To put this also into learning, one thing is that you can imagine using virtual reality and augmented reality for learning. And of course, one of the big questions here is, does it really help? And the answer is, it actually depends on the type of learning you want to test. So you can imagine if you just want to learn facts. There's no reason to try to bring on, at this time, any VR goggles. You can read a book, or you can read a document, or you can read online, or you can get instructions via traditional measures. But if you want to learn a skill, let's say you want to learn how to tile a wall, or you want to operate a difficult, dangerous machine, and this is part of your employee training, sure, you can watch videos, instructional videos. You can look at information, like a brochure, or you can be told by someone, this is all instructions and vocational learning, but actually doing it, that's risky on the real machine. And by testing these different kind of learning examples, we found out that VR has a unique place. By using VR for different type of learning pur purposes, like learning by doing, either tiling a wall or dangerous machines, we found that when you combine it with, for example, video teaching, that objective memory, so the ability to actually learn exactly how you should do things, in which order you should do things, improved by 40%. If you looked at the episodic memory, so asking people, okay, can you tell me step by step what you actually should do? It was 25% increase. It actually reached 100%, so it's a ceiling effect. And then at the end, also talking to people about how confident they felt about the learning, and that was almost doubled. And beyond that, you know, the willingness to take on the project like this was one thing, but people also felt willing to take on other projects as well. So we seem to find a kind of golden standard here that if you want to use optimized learning, then you should combine videos with VR for this type of learning. Going back to behavioral economics, you probably heard all, all heard about nudging, right? Nudging is where we are using what we know about the errors we make and the fallibilities of our human minds, the way of anchoring effects, for example, how that affects our decision making. This can also be used for good things. It can be done to improve behavior. It can be done for improving the way we understand the future, for example, in terms of environmentally friendly behaviors, because that's an abstract thing. It's hard for us to understand. And it can be done for traffic safety, for example. But nudging is only one thing. And the problem with nudging is that it's short-lived, and it depends on the nudge being available. It has to be visible, or at least available, to have an impact. As soon as it's gone, there's a fading off effect. You can't nudge a person to learn how to juggle. You have to learn it by what we call boosting in psychology. 
And boosting is exactly to empower our conscious minds by learning exactly the do's and don'ts. And one version of that is what we call de-biasing. And de-biasing is a kind of a step-by-step. -step. This comes very much from clinical psychology, how you can treat depression, for example, and anxiety and phobia. But it's basically the first step is paying attention, you know, noticing the bias. Am I aware of the bias? That's the first question you can ask yourself. Now you can say, I'm aware of that I might have some framing effects. I might feel scared because this kind of moonshots that we talk about here today and tomorrow seems so abstract. But now you know that your response is actually pretty natural. It's a natural response that you have. If you get to that point, then the next steps are basically mobilizing your mental uh, system to say, do I know which direction to go? Do I know what to do? Do I have the mental capacity? Do I have the motivation to do that? And if you can cross off yes to all of that, then you will be able to de-bias yourself. And for this talk, my hope was, of course, that we could start by pointing in some things and say that these are some of the errors we have when we are talking about transformation, when we talk about innovation, when we talk about leadership, and when we talk about decision-making in those contexts. So let me round off by a, um, a quote I have from Santiago uh, Ramona Yucajal, who was actually a few hundred years later, used the microscope to peer into matters of our minds. He looked at brain cells. He got the Nobel Prize in 1906 for, his under, for advancing his un, our understanding of our human brains. And what he discovered diving into the human mind was what we called neural plasticity, that our brains, and therefore also our minds, are malleable. They're changeable. And um, with that, I thank you for your attention.